Mary redeemed a $50,000 cash prize playing Chumba Casino this year. I was only playing for fun, so winning this was a dream come true. Chumba Casino is America's number one social casino experience. It's serious fun. With over 80 casino-style games to choose from, you too could win life-changing amounts of cash. Be like Mary. Log on to ChumbaCasino.com and give them a whirl. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void or prohibited by law. 18+. plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. The voice in the preceding commercial was not the actual voice of a winner. everybody, this is Jessica from Jessica Lazelle Cannon, and I'm so excited today because I have a really good friend of mine that has joined us, and this is uh, Katie Epps from My Body GX. And when I was going through the information that I wanted to discuss today for lifestyle, um, she was the first person that came to mind because she is awesome. So Katie, can you tell me what is My Body GX? Yeah. First, thank you so much for having me. I really am excited Absolutely. about this uh, topic. So My Body GX uses DNA testing um, for nutrition and fitness wellness. Um, we go through everything from how your body utilizes macronutrients, which are your proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, how your body breaks down food into micronutrients, which are your vitamins and minerals, and passes them through the cellular wall, all the way through... Um, how your body breaks down body fat through cardiovascular exercise, how your body changes with resistance training, um, your anti-aging properties, um, mental acuity, early hearing loss, um, systemic inflammation. So how does your body deal with the stress and the inflammation of the things that you're putting upon it? How do we correct that? What's the best way to feed you? When's the best time to train your body? And it's all 100% custom based on your DNA. So um my background, I have a degree in chemistry, but I've been in nutrition and fitness. Um, I mean, I've been, I had that interest for as long as I can remember. I've been coaching for 12 years. Um, I did bodybuilding for a while. So I got really into very specific tight nutrition and really tight um, fitness programming. I probably gave a lot of people uh, um, head cases over that <laughs> just due to how, you know, that body on bodybuilding, that's only an 18 hour physique. And so um, what I changed to in the last five years is really looking at lifestyle. So how do you, what I call, be boat ready? So when you put on a swimsuit and you go out on your boat, how do you feel amazing in the skin that you have? How do you have the most amount of energy? How do you feel, you know, the best gut health? Like nobody wants to feel gassy and bloated. Nobody right. wants to feel lethargic and tired. So how do you maintain that healthy lifestyle through all points in your life? Right. And that seems to be what happens to so many people right now is that they have lost focus of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, we fall into that comfort zone. We fall into the, this growing convenience. Yes. And yes. when we end up fatigued and we end up highly stressed and we end up having so many different issues and going to the wrong or the bad fixers. And a lot of time that ends up being food. Right. And Food goes in two ways. It can either be a comfort thing or a control thing. So if you're using it as a comfort, a lot of people end up gaining weight or, um, you know, smashing their adrenals or just feeling that overall emotional fatigue from what those, you know, heavy starchy or processed foods do to you, or they use food as a control. And that's really where that um, relationship with food turns into a very negative thing. So right. are they controlling how they're eating? Um, that really, the yo-yo dieting and um, exactly. crash dieting. So you're still <laughs> putting your body into adrenal fatigue only now you're starving while doing it. So exactly. <laughs> so now you're hangry. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now you're hangry and hateful, or you could be like chubby and happy, but you're not really happy. Exactly. And that's where over a period of time, we don't realize how much we're actually damaging our system. Yes. And as I got further into caring for my mother, that's where I realized what was happening to her? Why was this happening to her? And is this something that could potentially happen to me? Mm -hmm. You know, and so I stopped right away and started looking into it. And I admit, I approached this in the beginning, I approached it in a very vain sure. <laughs> way because... Sure. I don't want to um, 
I don't want to increase my aging any faster than it already naturally mm -hmm. would be. But at the same time, I don't want this to be my story in the end. And facing possible dementia, the first thing I thought of was, oh, this is just genetic related. So this eventually will be me. But then when I started to actually pay closer attention to her and watch her routines, um, see what she was eating, when she was eating, how mm -hmm. much she was eating, that started to clue me in that this can't all be genetic. Right. And so the further I researched it, I realized, and it actually came to be more of a relief that this is not purely genetic. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I want people to understand that if you have someone in your family and they have um, any form of dementia, not to automatically just reside to the fact that this is going to be me because it's genetics, because there are so many things that we can do now and so many things that um, young parents can do now that can totally change that trajectory of our lives just by changing our lifestyle. You're exactly right. So genetics, like your actual DNA, is your predisposition for something. It's not your end-all, be-all. You can change right. things environmentally. So as an example, on a very superficial phase, my body will naturally has a low tendency to burn body fat through cardiovascular exercise. I know y'all can't see me, but I'm 5'3 and 115. So I'm, I have no issue losing body fat in that, I mean, genetically, quote unquote, I do, but knowing that information about my body is how I learned then to manipulate my environment to figure out how to change that. So right. ultimately, what does that actually mean? It just means that my body goes through glucose and glycogen slower. So if you have that information, how do you treat it? And so knowing that you have a genetic predisposition to potentially acquiring Alzheimer's, you could then look at environmentally, what can you do for your body? What can you do for your family? And even for your aging parent, like what can you do for them to either ease or eliminate the effects of that disease? So how do you start feeding your body? And you can really look at then that as food is your medicine. Exactly. And that's where I've come to is that instead of doing the convenience or the quick fix, um, if I'm dealing with fatigue issues, if I'm dealing with um, a lot of cravings, stop and think, what am I feeding myself? What am I doing that I should undo? And then instead of using other alternatives as my medicine, so to speak, mm -hmm. then food really should be my focal point as far as food being my medicine. So how is that something that someone could potentially change or learn to add into their diets or their lifestyle now? Sure. Well, let's first talk about food. What is it broken down into? So some people have heard of like count your macros, count your calories. People don't really know what that actually means. So your macronutrients are your actually energy, is the energy that's provided by food, which is your protein, your fat, and your carbohydrates. So many foods are a combination of one or more of those things. So for example, animal protein is a combination of both protein and fat. Your vegetables are generally a combination of carbohydrates and protein. Avocado is um, carbohyd is actually all three, carbohydrates, fat, and protein. So everything has a little bit of a different ratio. So understanding that initially, so what are you feeding your body that you're for your energy? What does that energy source look like? But then secondarily, your food also breaks down into your um, micronutrients, which are your vitamins and minerals. And this is a lot of time where you can actually increase your, your mood, your energy, heal your body internally by utilizing that information of your micronutrients. So for an example, vitamin B6, I call our happy vitamin because it is our natural mood elevator. It actually naturally gives us more energy. So for example, if you were, say, hitting the 3 o'clock hour and you're like, mm -hmm gosh, you know, like I'm just, I'm not feeling it. You don't really want to go grab that, you know, third cup of coffee of the exactly. day. What could you feed your body to reboost your body, your natural hormones, your natural energy levels? Well, be six rich foods. You could have a handful of pistachios. You could have a little bowl of watermelon. If you were looking more on the protein side, tuna has a lot of uh, B6 in it. You could do a piece of avocado toast. Right. So all those things, like you can naturally boost your own energy and you can look at then the foods that you're consuming too. Like if you decided to do pistachios, 
that is a fat and a little bit of a protein. So you could actually have that and know that you're feeding your body a good quality fat, which is something that we'll probably at, at some point talk about, like good fats versus bad fats. Um, but feeding yourself something really good and nutritious, and then you'll you also know that you can then go get through that fatigue while still feeding your body good things. Right, and the more I did this, and as I gradually learned bit by bit, I found myself with so much more energy. I was able to sustain that energy throughout the day, mm -hmm. and I wasn't hitting that two o'clock lull like I mm -hmm. used to. And before I stepped away from the whole corporate world, I realized a lot of corporate offices put so much money into their coffee mm -hmm. and the break room setup because that's what, in their mind, keeps their employees productive. And when I fell into that trap of the caffeine fix at 2 o'clock, then yeah. I was, it seemed like it helped me get that last bit of burst of energy for the day, but I was that much more exhausted by the yeah. time I got home and heading towards the couch, sitting on the phone, sifting through social media, just, and saying, I don't have the energy, I know I should be working out or even walking in the very least, but I was just too tired, mm -hmm. mentally exhausted, but physically exhausted. And then as I stepped into my mother's world, I saw her way more fatigued more often, and then looking at the types of food she was eating. It was like, how do I shift this? And so I thought, well, if this is working for me, then I need to try and start putting this into her diet mm -hmm. as well. But then I found myself in that very frustrating position where the more she declined mentally, I found myself comparing her to my children, the age-wise. And I know mm -hmm. that's it's hard to do and it's hard to accept, but then I realized if I'm going to hide food <laughs> or yeah. trick them to eat good, then I had to do the same thing for her and trick her to eat. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And oh my gosh, there's so many fun, truly fun ways to hide nutrition into food. I have tons of recipes. Um, I do it to my family a lot. I was sharing with you a story <laughs> earlier. Um, this is a word to the wise out there. Um, I puree a lot of food. Um, so I'll pu puree spaghetti, um, squash, I'll puree zucchini, butternut squash, um, cooked and cooled, um, sweet potatoes. Well, I found a recipe for beets and Jessica, I actually got this from Jessica Seinfeld, Jerry Seinfeld's wife. She really? has three or four cookbooks and they're all about super convenient, um, you know, kind of life on the go, moms on the go, caregivers That's on perfect. the go. Yes. But because she has, I think, three or four children, she was also trying to get them to eat more vegetables and more well-rounded well foods and things like that. So she started pureeing all these foods and putting them into dishes that she was naturally perfect. cooking. For as an example, she would make her family macaroni and cheese, but then she would also put in um, butternut squash into it. And it was not detectable because it's a very lightly flavored vegetable. And especially once it's boiled and then cooked or, you know, cooked down or baked and cooked. So I was following all these recipes. Well, I decided that I was going to puree some beets. <laughs> <laughs> and I was making meatloaf that night. And so I took all of the leftover puree from the things that I had portioned out. And there was sweet potato and a little bit of butternut squash. I think there was a little bit of zucchini. I think there was maybe a little leftover carrot. And then there was a beet in there. And I just mixed it all into my ground turkey with some onion and garlic, whatever and put it in the oven and I baked it. Well, my husband knew that I was working on pureeing these foods and he was like, so uh, what are we eating tonight? And I was like, oh, just meatloaf, it's fine. You love meatloaf. Anyway, I cut down the center of this turkey meatloaf, which is generally white in color, right. fluorescent pink tube down the center. And he was like, what is that? And I was like, "Busted." I mean, maybe some beets. And he's like, oh, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna taste like dirt it does taste like i was like it does not it tastes right. amazing <laughs> and then you get back into your head because yeah, you yeah. know i don't like the taste of this because as a kid maybe because sure. that was my thing as sure. a kid i hated brussels sprouts just yeah. hated them and i could never <laughs> even come close to cauliflower but now as an adult things change and you learn how to season things and you know we're not no longer eating you know frozen boiled Oh, right. Brussels sprouts, which is super foul. Now we're having things like, you know, roasted Brussels sprouts with balsamic vinegar right. that's been caramelized and things that are a lot more thoughtfully uh, flavorful. But also in pureeing food, 
you want to be careful what foods you puree. So you want to make sure that it's foods that are naturally either sweet or light in flavor. So think mm. that you would do like your carrots. Um, parsnips is a great one because it's almost flavorless, um, but it has a lot of nutrients in it. Spinach is another thing, oh, right. although it will give you that green undertone depending on what you're putting it in. Right. But then other foods that are very flavorful, like I would not puree asparagus. Oh, or no. Brussels that makes, sprouts is your example. That makes sense. Yeah. That so makes you want to do things that are lighter and, and sweeter in flavor because you can really fold those into most things. And because most of our processed foods are so artificially enhanced with sweetness, right. um, our families never really realize that we're putting a vegetable as a sweetener as opposed to whatever processed perfect. food comes in. That's perfect because my mother had a, a, another thing as she's declined, her palate has become... Um, bitter and sweet. Mm. She will not eat so many different foods. Thankfully, she likes, or I should say, loves sweet potatoes, but I can't give that to her every day, every day. Even mm -hmm. I get burned out after several days in a row. Mm -hmm. But she won't, doesn't want to eat unless items are sweet. And mm -hmm. so I had to revert to, okay, if I couldn't find a good balanced meal for her regularly, then we started supplementing shakes where I would put um, all of the berries, the strawberries, yep. raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, bananas, and then throw in um, a healthy organic plant mix. She loved it because it was sweet and she didn't realize what she was getting. And I would alternate depending on how much water she had for the day. I'd either use coconut water mm -hmm. or I would use uh, rice milk instead. And it would be something that would she loved it, and I felt so much relief because she was finally getting something well balanced. But I kind of got booted back with it because I tried and got a little ahead of myself. I tried to throw in the spinach and the kale, and when but it turned the wrong color and it turned green. Yeah. And so instead of it being this wonderful pinkish or purplish drink, yeah. she wouldn't touch it because what is this? It's green. Ew. And I would try, you know, and I could do the spinach and kale with the green apple or with kiwi or something that would keep it sweet, but it was green. So mm -hmm. it was the wrong color to yep. get her. My children are the same way. I will flavor, you know, bananas are extremely strong in flavor. Pineapple right. is extremely strong in flavor. And so I'll do like maybe pineapple and strawberry, coconut milk, you know, and then it kind of like pina colada-esque. Right. But then right. I'll throw in a handful of spinach. Like, why is it green? Like my husband will literally be like, um, yeah, you can make me a smoothie as long as it, there's nothing green in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> but avocado, that's like the best thing to have. And it then. makes it so smooth. And it's creamy. Yes. Yes. I have some like I've I have some examples of some really fun ones that you can incorporate and oh something that would be really good for um, your mom is um, zucchini or pumpkin bread because you can grade a bunch of extra vegetables in it not only the zucchini but you could even add things like raisins you could add um, walnuts to give you know walnuts break down into omega uh, omega three right, and sixes right. I think three and sixes plus a little bit of protein so you're getting those higher quality while still giving her a sweet quote unquote treat exactly mashed potatoes um, this is my really? new favorite thing I take mashed potatoes. And when I'm boiling the potatoes, I put in... Have you seen those, like, riced cauliflower bits? They yes. call it cauli bits? Yes. Um, I don't know if they called it everywhere. They called it H-E-B here. But I, I'll take a half a bag, and I'll boil it with the potatoes. And then um, I take non-fat Greek yogurt instead of sour cream. And Even better. Salt and pepper. And I take the hand mixer and blend it together so nobody ever knows. Um, sometimes I'll grate a fresh uh, garlic into it. Um, and it's super flavorful, yes. super everything. And nobody ever knows that it doesn't have, or that it has uh, the cauliflower in it. You could also grade parsnips in there. You could do celery when it's boiling because all that basically boils down to mush. And then when you blend it together, you can't see it. You can't taste it. It just is like mashed potatoes. Right. Um, super flavorful. That's perfect. I hide a lot of things in any kind of ground meat. So if you're making meatballs, you can do it depending on what kind. If you're making Italian meatballs, I would do something um, a little bit more sassy. So something like a parsnip that doesn't have a lot of flavor. But if you're going to do kofta, and we were talking about this earlier, which um, for people that don't know what it is, it's a Lebanese or Greek uh, meatball. You can mix it with lamb or beef or chicken or turkey and um, whatever ground protein that you want. But because it has allspice is one of the most flavorful spices that's a sweeter spice you could put sweet but like cooked cooled and pureed sweet potato or um hmm. butternut squash in there 
and it just gives it a little bit more texture, a little bit more flavor. My mom and I make spaghetti sauce and we make it quarterly. And we take whole real tomatoes, zucchini, summer squash, butternut squash, bell peppers, onions, garlic, mushrooms, carrots, and spinach and bake them in the oven. And when then they come out, then I put them in the blender and process them. And then I cook it with fresh garlic and tomatoes and olive oil and then kind of bring all of that up to a boil and that creates the base of the sauce. And then the carrots actually come in at the very end. So most spaghetti sauce, I don't know if you know this, um, has sugar in it because right. it cuts the acid. Exactly. If you put a cup and a half of carrots, which is adding you know, tons of vitamins, nutrients, beta carotene into it, you don't actually need the sugar. Because it naturally sweetens it. it. Naturally sweetens I it. love that. And that's the alternative. So that's another thing that I learned that it wasn't, when I started to change my diet, I kind of had that feeling of loss. Mm -hmm. But then I realized if I would just substitute one for something else that it wasn't, I wasn't losing anything and I was gaining mm -hmm. in the end. So that's. Do you like pizza? I love pizza. Oh my gosh. Okay. So um, have you heard of Cola Power? Yes, I've just recently come into that. So for those of you who don't know, Cola Power is a cauliflower based pizza crust. It's very crispy. Mm -hmm. So it's like a thin crust. I've done this. You can make an entire vegetable pizza off of it. So like Perfect. I'll do like a little drizzle of olive oil, paint it through. All of your favorite things. So like um, we put spinach, mushrooms, olives, um, bell peppers, onion, jalapeno because I like spicy. Oh yeah. And then you can either do, depending on your cheese of choice, you could do, you know, a buffalo mozzarella. You could do just, you know, plain mozzarella or something. Um, or you can do like goat cheeses or sheep cheeses. And especially people that have lactose allergies, these and are very safe. I, mm -hmm. I fall in that category, unfortunately, and see, and that's my drawback is as I continue to learn good food, bad food, that's one of the things where it's really confusing. Cheese is good, cheese is bad, dairy's good, dairy's bad, eggs are good, eggs are bad. I mean, balancing that out and, of course, anything is okay in moderation, but mm -hmm. there are some things that aren't really okay because it throws the bacteria, and that's... One of the things that I never considered before, mm -hmm. but I had as you, once you get onto this path and it starts to kind of snowball because you get so much more information that you realize not only is food our medicine, but the reason it's our medicine is because there's this thing called brain gut connection. Yep. And what I finally found out was the bacteria. And at first I thought, well, bacteria, does that mean I'm... Um, is it something infectious? Am I sick? Right. Uh, but there's really, our bodies are so magnificent because there is really a design, a deliberate design in having a certain amount of good bacteria and bad bacteria. And certain foods that we eat throw that balance off. Yes. Yeah. So would it shock you to know that you have over 100 million neurons in your stomach? So like, you know, that whole gut feeling when your mm -hmm. belly kind of flip flops and your like bowels turn to water and you're extremely nervous or extremely anxious. Right. That's all, that's all gut that has nothing really to do with your brain. And it's really your body's, um, preparation for what it's going to deal with situationally and keeping those, that balance corrected making sure that your serotonin levels stay on point, making sure that you have like that really good base and connection so that when you do come into those stressful situations, whether that is caring for a parent or a work event or something with your children, whatever right. it is that you're coming into, that your body actually is prepared. And so almost, so like we were talking about, like being a preemptive strike, making sure that we are prepared for whatever negativity that's going to eventually pop into our life that we can then respond to it in a healthy, positive way. So our bodies respond that way too. Right. So, um, there's a few things that you can do to really improve your gut health. Um, the main thing is eating a diverse group of foods. And I love to talk to people cause they're like, I absolutely detest put in the space, whatever food you absolutely detest. Right. And I would say, well, you know what? You're so lucky because God gave us so many foods because exactly. he knew <laughs> we weren't going to like just one. I mean, if he didn't want us to have this beautiful variety with all these colors and all of this flavor, um, we probably could have just eaten dirt and survived. I mean, he had that power. <laughs> Thank God he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so knowing that and eating a variety, uh, diverse variety, most of us get lost in that. So 
As a general rule, the American diet comes down to we eat about five different proteins and about 12 different vegetables. But there is just so much more variety yes. out there yes. that not only is going to give us more flavor and more excitement in our meals, but actually that biodiversity. So what prebiotics, so how does your gut initially right. handle your food? Your probiotic, how does it continue to digest that food and pass it along in your actual intestines, the prebiotic in your in your gut? All of those things actually play a part into not only our absorption, but then also our mood and our energy mm-hmm. levels and our adrenals and how our hormones right. are responding. A lot of women in their, and this is sort of slightly off subject, but um, a lot of women in their mid-30s to mid-40s start exuding signs of thyroid issues. Mm-hmm. This is more so than ever before in history, and I don't think it's because we have a more advanced scientific understanding. I think it's because more than any other time in history, we put so much more stress, Yes. not only on ourselves, but environmentally, we allow that stress to take over, and we're not handling that systemic inflammation in a healthy way. Right. And you saw that a lot. Yeah, and that's where that vicious cycle comes in, and that's where I... I struggled for many years where I had to break that cycle. I think, of course, not everybody has the opportunity to step away from the corporate world. Mm -hmm. That's their livelihood. But Mm -hmm. knowing, had I known this while I was there working, it would have been something I could have incorporated into the day-to-day. But it was like I kept having all these excuses. I don't have the time for this. I don't have the energy for this. I don't have the focus for that. I kept pushing it away and... Mm -hmm. The more I pushed it away, I just had to keep existing. I had to keep up with the the day to day demands, and whether that was parenting, whether that was at work, or my own personal level of <laughs> emotions. I just kept pushing it away until I realized if something's going to change, it's going to have to be little bits day by day, mm-hmm. and I had to start somewhere. And the food. And then the exercise, and then the sleep, and then the meditation. I mean, all this kind of stuff, and we'll get further into some of that. But seeing the difference between what I was experiencing and then watching what my mother was experiencing, that's what kept me going back. What did she do when she was in her 30s and 40s? And it seemed like we have been in this pattern for so long. And as time goes by, you know, it's no longer the single working family, like one spouse works, the other spouse stays home. There's so many of us that there's two spouses working and the kids are fending for themselves mm-hmm. or um, there's the fast food run through because that's the convenient time fill in. So that this drawback of this roller coaster ride of hormones rising, hormones falling, yes. and then not knowing is it do, did I just, because part of my issue was pushing it back was oh I'm just getting older Mm, so mm -hmm. I was I was trying to accept it as I'm just getting older it's part of aging but it's not always the case right and so the more I tried to adjust my mother's daily routine and seeing that my improvements were working guess what it started to work for her too Mm -hmm. and it didn't have an issue with age it was that's when I started realizing the balancing between her gut and her mood swings Mm -hmm. her cravings I mean her hormonal level because it just all seemed to work Mm -hmm. the more that you can naturally I mean because we we have to eat anyway right? right the more that you can diversify your foods and put in good foods um especially So I think most of us at some point, either in the day or in the week, have a sweet tooth. Oh, yeah. How do you... (laughs) Definitely. Yeah. So how do you you put the right things in and still curb that sweet tooth? And there's so many great options. I mean, obviously fruit is the number one that's going to be a perfect go-to. But I have so many people that are like, oh, but I really love chocolate. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, Unless you have an issue with um, kidney stones, um, dark chocolate is a great option. Um, You can melt it down and put it in with your um, peanut butter or or your nut butter. You could honestly just have a square of Dove dark chocolate. And then how do you pair it so that you're not just going to eat another square and then another square? And so usually like when I'll write a nutrition plan, especially if somebody who's like, I absolutely must have chocolate in my daily routine. Great. Yeah. So you can do it a few different ways. One, you can do it as a chocolate smoothie and you can do, you know, like chocolate protein and some cherries. And if you like mocha, you can add a little cold coffee to it. Mm -hmm. Really great morning 
honestly, it's probably one of my favorite uh, morning smoothies. Or if you want to, if you're more of a nighttime chocolate person, you can take that dark chocolate of your Dove, take blueberries and cashews and chop up your dark chocolate or, you know, maybe get small chips of dark chocolate. And then you have a finger snack. That's perfect. Or you could melt it and put it over, like drizzle it over an apple and almond butter with some dark that's chocolate. That's even better because that falls right into the whole portion control. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's honestly more than anything, and I see this a lot with vegans and vegetarians specifically, um, people are putting good things many times in their body but not in the right portion. So I don't know if you've ever seen like the beautiful Pinterest picture and this is my favorite one to paint. <laughs> It's this gorgeous salad, and you have like all of these beautiful underlying tones of, you know, leafy greens and shaved carrot and maybe some beet and maybe some radish. And it's just like all these beautiful colors. And on top of it is two avocados sitting open face. Mm -hmm. And then in the middle of those avocados where the pits used to be is um, two hard-boiled eggs cut in half. And so it's like, you know, all of the amazing under color and on the top is you know the beautiful green then white then yellow and you know that separates into the four that's 50 grams of fat well that's one of the things that I didn't understand was I started making my salads and if I just incorporated all of the bright colors as many as I could and of course after a period of time those same bright colors I kept having over and over and over, I had mm -hmm. to figure out, okay, what other colors are out there? Yes. What other things can I add to my salad and still get it? But then again, I think I made it so lean that I wasn't putting enough fat in it. Mm -hmm. That's so possible. So adding the avocado was great, but then I realized I didn't, I was also adding the egg and I thought, well, it, in some cases I really could have, depending on my activity for the day, I guess. Mm -hmm. And if it was, um, lunch or if it was a dinner how much should I have added because mm -hmm. putting that egg in there on top of the avocado it's like I doubled up on the protein for me for mm -hmm. my myself right and then on top of it if I put all of this wonderful stuff in there I felt like I canceled it out just by adding dressing uh -huh. and then I had to be considerate of what kind of dressing I could add yes and dressing a lot of times will throw things off a lot the way that I always recommend people flavor their foods, especially things like their salads and such, is um, with citrus because there's no, really no calories um, associated with it. Now, a lot of times, like I've been told, like a dressing has to be an oil and an acid and a sweetener. Eh, I don't think so. Like, mm. I, I think it depends. So my absolute all-time favorite salad is an arugula salad with um, shaved parmesan, salt, pepper, and drizzled in lemon. That's it. Nice. And it's so simple. It's so simple. It's so easy. It's a great, beautiful side dish for really any protein, any meal that you're making. It goes Italian. It goes um, Greek. It goes you know like whatever your flavors are. Um, it's a little awkward with Thai food and Asian food, but True. Um, but honestly, then you have like the plethora of like oh my gosh, you could do like bok choy, you can, you know, like right. the Asian style has like its own incredible variety of flavors of vegetables in themselves. But I agree with you. I think having different salads, or I think most of us think of salad as like the base of green and then shapes and vegetables on top. Yes. But it doesn't have to be that lame. Like it, there can be a lot more to it. So, And I think that's where people get turned off with salads because when you think of Oh, lifestyle and diets. And I, I know when I was trying to introduce my sister to kale, <laughs> her first response was, no, thanks. I'm not a cow. I don't like to eat grass. <laughs> Fair. <And> so <laughs> I get that. But there's so many different ways of how to prepare the food. Mm -hmm. And even for myself, when I got burned out on something, it was because I wasn't switching things up. I was thinking it had to be a very specific way. And mm -hmm. there's so many different things out there. One of my most recent um, fun salads that I made is, um, have you had radicchio? No. It's, okay, so radicchio is a, it's a purple lettuce. Um, it's a little bit slightly sharper in taste. It looks like a purple cabbage, only smaller. Cut off the bottom and it has the same look as like a cabbage. You'd open it um, open leaf um, style. But then I found a recipe where you marinate, or I'm sorry, not marinate, saute mushrooms. I think it was mushrooms, onions, and thyme. 
Hmm. And it was a variety of mushrooms. So it was shiitake, it was oyster. I went ahead and went bananas with the mushrooms because <laughs> I was like, well, they have all these great, you know, textures and nutrients in them. Um, really good prebiotics. Uh, so I, I think I did oyster mushrooms. Anyway, I did four or five different mushrooms. I went ahead and splurged a little bit on that. But then you saute them down and cook them down a little bit. And so they're hot. And then you put it on this fresh, crisp radicchio. And I don't remember. I, I think you would have the option of either sprinkling it with parm or not. Oh, I don't right. believe that we did. Um, but it was so flavorful. And it hmm. was so beautiful. Because it was that purple leaf, and then it had like the mushroom, and then the green thyme. It was it was beautiful um, for a salad, and just a completely different take on a salad because it wasn't green at all. It was purple. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it totally changes everything. Totally up. changes everything. I think cooked vegetables we run into that same issue as well. Is that you're like oh, broccoli again, green beans? Yeah, green beans. Oh gosh, growing up with that. Yeah. Uh, if you know, and that was the thing is. And we did a previous show on the boomerang effect. And to me, growing up with vegetables, that very narrow-minded... And not to speak ill of my parents in any way, but it's just you know what you know. Mm -hmm. And their family didn't have very many vegetables. It was always the Spanish rice, fried pork chops, fried bananas. Mm -hmm. You know, just mm -hmm. a lot of the heavy Puerto Rican rich. And yes, flavorful, but a lot of heavy foods that very little to no vegetables and definitely not any interest in salads. It's interesting what is popular and it's interesting what's popular depending on where you live in the world. So for example, probably the two healthiest cultures is Japanese and Mediterranean and Mediterranean will go everywhere from um, the southern tip of Spain obviously the bottom half of Italy Sicily Greece and then we're looking into that Lebanese culture right. and their flavors are so bright mm -hmm. and um, there's a lot of fish there's a lot of good fat so some olives olive oil um, a lot of goat cheeses because in that mountain area that that was a little bit easier for um, them to cultivate as opposed to cows which they um, need that range true, for true. um so just naturally due to their environment they were producing something that was healthier for them anyway but then lots of like green food and lots of fruit and so that culturally those countries and the those peoples are just naturally have better lifestyle, better skin, better exactly. hair, better physiques. And then you look at Western diet and a lot of um, Central, South, even South American. Depending on if you live on the coast, they have a tendency to have more fishes and more vegetables. But True. the more inner towards the center of those countries, I mean, it's a lot of rice and beans. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is it's a complete protein. You can be very, very poor and right. be able to afford it. But because it's a complete protein, people aren't suffering from the ill effects of not having those um, branched chain amino acids that we don't naturally produce. But then they're just, they're not getting, they pass down from culture to culture. Like, mm -hmm. all right, let's go ahead and ground up some corn and we'll put, you know, corn with some rice and some beans and here's your dinner. Right. Wow. Exciting. <laughs> Missed the mark on that one. Yeah, yeah. So, and that, and culture, um, American culture is just as bad because so much of our country is in the center of mm -hmm. our country, which is, you know, that Midwestern or, you know, central farmland, um, cows, just not a lot like meat and potatoes. Like, we're kind of a right. meat and potato culture, and it's just, it, it's economical. And True. it's easy to cultivate, even in really like bad soil. And so over the last, you know, 150 years, that's what people are generating more too. Now I will give it, I will give us that in the last probably 20 years, we are becoming a lot more thoughtful and intelligent. About, Finally. Yes. About the food that's coming in. So it'll be great for our children right. and the generations going forward. But for those of us who are in our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, exactly, we're fighting what our parents thought were, was awesome in that they could buy cereal at the store as opposed to making oatmeal or porridge at home. See, and that's where we have to stop and 
think and relearn Mm -hmm. and the the big thing be open to learning and Mm -hmm. wanting to to change it's hard yeah and something that you talked about was so much of and this was before we jumped on uh, the podcast but something you had talked about was so much of what we eat is learned when we go to school exactly and that's what is frustrating to me is that learning where we are now me personally how did I get to this point? Well, of course, that took me back down memory lane and how I grew up and what I learned from my parents and then what my grandparents taught my parents. And I just kept going further and further back. And I realized this is a way of life that we've learned. And so now at this point in time, we have to stop and relearn. But how do we relearn when our children in school are learning the same exact poor habits and they're advocating for it? And it's it turns into the political part of it. Then you go into a totally different area where it's all marketing based. So the marketing ploy of all of this and the, to the extent of the lobbyists, you know, where you have beef companies and dairy companies who lobby into the heart foundations. And uh, it's just incredible. And how our kids continually get bombarded with this and, when I started looking into my own diets, my own day-to-day habits and transitioning then my children into it because they are, as we've heard so many different times, uh, they are our future. Mm -hmm. And I don't want, I've tried to tell my sons that I don't want them to have to step back and catch that boomerang of having to then come back once they get out into the world. And yes, I want to see them and, and enjoy as they get older and they get married and have kids, but I don't want them to have to return so much earlier in life as I have for my mother so that they could care for me just because I had poor habits, but transitioning them out of their bad habits that I've indirectly taught them because from what I know, that's been a struggle because once you start off with, and you had mentioned earlier with the macaroni and cheese, starting off the convenient areas where at first... I had one that my oldest would eat anything you put in front of them, Mm -hmm. except for squash. (laughs) And then I had my second that would only eat nuggets and mac and cheese. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because that's what I introduced them to after a while. And it was really hard to break. And even Mm -hmm. now as a teenager, and I experienced it to an extent, young adult, that uh, these bad effects, side effects of some of the foods that are out there. Yeah. Acne. You know, what teenager out there doesn't already go through acne as an issue for, you know, hormonally, but then you throw in certain foods that cause it and it's way worse. And so uh, as an adult, I had the adult acne for a couple of years and because I was so highly stressed and I'd come home Mm -hmm. from work and I'd sit on the couch and I'd binge on potato chips, Lay's potato chips. Yep. And when I finally got to the point where I needed, I realized I needed to make that change and pulling back from that, Mm -hmm. it was hard. I did have to literally wean myself off of this, but my face cleared up, the acne went away, and then I thought, well, if this is for me, then I need to do the same for my son. So I had slowly stopped buying things, and it Mm -hmm. all had to be a slow. It couldn't be cold turkey cut, because that's where you get the yo-yo diets. Right. And and when you're fighting that craving, then you're not really changing things. You're just temporarily (laughs) postponing. Right. So this... This way of how we are teaching our children is huge. For sure. Because even in the Asian culture overseas, they have our Western diet is going further and further out into the world. Mm -hmm. And the more they are adapting to our Western diet, the more their younger generation are abandoning their traditional food Healthy food, yeah. Healthy foods. And now even in the Asian cultures, they are also dealing with astronomically rising numbers of Alzheimer's. I feel like government-wise, they're getting a little bit better. So in 2011, they came out with something called Plate, or My Plate. And the government started shifting their view on what traditional, or what quote-unquote healthy food should look like. So if we all think back to when we were kids in school and we think of the food pyramid... On the bottom was all the brown food. Right. And then above it was, you know, dairy and protein and animal proteins. Like, they didn't really talk about plant proteins at that time. And then you had, second to the top, in one of the smaller sections, you did half fruit and half vegetables. 
and then at the very top was your sugars and your fats. What they've done now is they're actually encouraging a more plant-based mm-hmm. um, nutrition plan. So the biggest part of if you think about a plate as being a circle, and if you were to cut it into four quadrants and shift that those quadrants, so maybe um, instead of it being a quarter, maybe a third of your nutrition should come from green vegetables and maybe a quarter from fruit and then maybe a quarter from grain and then less than that would be so less than your third of your quarter your quarter your third would be your animal protein or True. honestly it doesn't even have to be animal protein because you could really look at different sources of plant-based proteins and that's legumes things like that absolutely true and that's something that we need to go towards more often than not mm-hmm. just because when i started to do that my energy level was yes. there. It totally sustained me and it, it supports the fact. And yep. when my sister made the comment of she didn't want to have kale just because she's not a cow. Well, if you look at the animals, look at rabbits, look at the horses, you yeah. know, their muscle tone, look yes. what they eat, their daily diets. And it's a lot of plant-based green, mm-hmm. you know, and so it's not, they're not eating animal protein. Right. Right. Obviously not. They're Right. Not all of them were meant to, but so like we're omnivores, so we can. Um, we definitely have the gut True. bacteria to do it. We definitely have the teeth for it. I think it's great to make that as a personal choice. But if you want to try a more um, plant-based or even just a whole food-based nutrition plan, um, there's so many really fun ones. I say fun because I, I, I like to try different nutrition plans. Um, but different ones out there that you can try. And I think the one that comes to mind, and this was a huge effect on my family, was in January we did Whole30. And there's a reason they call it Whole30 and not Whole Life. It is not sustainable. Mm. Um, but it's an exclusionary diet. So basically, no dairy, no sugar, no grains, which includes corn. Corn is a grain. Mm-hmm. No legumes. No alcohol, of course, because that is sugar. So for 90 days, or for, I'm sorry, for 30 days, you're eating... Only whole foods, fruits and vegetables. You can do some plant or nut-based powders, but the goal is not to like remake food that you binge on in you know approved food. So, for example, you you wouldn't make pancakes out of almond flour because oh. that's obviously something that would be binge worthy for you. But you could use it, you know, as like filler for making a meatball or something like that. You know, all whole natural animal or fish proteins if you decide to do that you could do it 100% plant-based all of your oils are natural buys so for fat you wouldn't do butter but you could do ghee which is a clarified butter um Mm. they take all the lactose off of it um when they boil it you could do olive oil of course you could do avocado of course um certain coconut oils um if you wanted a more salty flavor you would do coconut aminos as opposed to normal aminos oh no soy was another thing that was right, on there right. but that basically takes all of the inflammatory foods out of your body and you're just feeding your body all whole natural foods now this is two amazing things if you're willing to try it one it's going to give you tons of new recipes because you're so limited in True. the things that you can make It also makes you more experimental because you're willing to try more foods because let's be real, there's only so many sweet potatoes, red potatoes, and broccoli and chicken you can eat in a month. (laughs) Because there's no grains, you have to be very thoughtful about your breakfast. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, also no smoothies. So no fast ways of getting out of things. So it's like a, a, not necessarily a a cleanse. Yeah, it's a full system restart. Yeah. So because no dairy, there's also no yogurt, but then in a correlation with that, they don't even want you to do yogurts um, that are, you know, coconut or whatever based. They Mm -hmm. really want you to start fresh from natural fruits and vegetables. And this was amazing for my family because my mom has hip dysplasia. Um, She has um, osteoarthritis in her hip. A year ago, well, maybe a little longer than a year ago, she'd gotten into a car accident and got um, T-boned. Well, starting after that, she was getting like this pain in her hip. And she probably already had the arthritis, but that definitely aggravated it. Well, over the course of like two or three months after the accident, um, she was just kind of like walking funny and having a little bit more issues. And my mom's young. And um, she was, I mean, so young, she helps take care of my children. She works at our church and, you know, works with the babies. You know, she's um, the leader of Sunday school from birth to three-year-old. So she is up, down, you know, with the babies, high energy. So she is... An incredible woman. Well, 
my husband called me and I was working at the, uh, at an office at the time. He said, your mom can't move her left side. And my yeah. initial thought was stroke. Yes. And so I left the office, drove home. I'm like, mom, stick out your tongue. And she's like, I'm not having a stroke. And I was like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Go through the face steps. I was like, okay. So was, she's like, I can't stand up. She's like, I'm in so much pain. So we ended up taking her to the emergency room. They did an MRI on her. And I'm not even kidding you. The doctor said hip replacement surgery. And I was like, right you're an bat. ER doctor. Like, we haven't even discussed anything. Like, you don't even know what happened. Like, just, yeah, hip replacement surgery. So they send her um, to another doctor. And that doctor barely looks at anything and says hip replacement surgery. That was the quick, easy answer. And I looked at her and I was like, Mom, there's got to be... There's got to be something else. So um, we went to a compound pharmacy here in Austin, People's Pharmacy. They do everything like homeopathic or as much as humanly possible. Um, They're great at weaning people off of pharmaceutical drugs onto a more homeopathic um, path. So we went in and said, okay, these are my symptoms. This is my issue. This is what I've been diagnosed with. What are my options? And so she started doing a collagen replacement. She did, you know, an osteoarthritis, multivitamin supplement type thing and so she was taking three pills a day she had to take them before she ate in the morning it upset her stomach but it was better than the hip pain so she did that for almost a about nine ten months almost a year well when we did whole 30 on day five she had no hip pain that's awesome she could walk completely straight there was no limping she was having no issues and she felt amazing Hmm. and so i was like huh exactly i wonder what it is so after Whole30, what they encourage you to do is to start reintroducing those foods that you had excluded. So go ahead and have that glass of wine. If the next day you feel bingy on it, mm-hmm. maybe that's kind of your trigger food. And then they recommend going back on Whole30 for a day or two. Not like for the Whole30 days, but Not just that same plan. Right. Incorporate a little bit of dairy. How do you feel after you ate a little ice cream? How do you feel after you had a slice of bread? And what we noticed was anytime that she ate anything with gluten in it, mm-hmm. the inflammation was so bad she would hurt for days. Exactly. For a, a piece of toast, you know, or for thing that they, they it sneaks up on you. It's like, you know, breaded chicken or something of that nature. And we don't think about that. Exactly. We don't see that as bread. Correct. Um pasta. Yep. Yep. The staples. Um, so as we were kind of slowly reintroducing some of these foods and she was going through those moments of she's this is just too much it just hurts and so we ended up adapting more of a grain-free lifestyle because she feels so much better and no hip replacement no hip replacement and she is a thousand times better she stopped all of her supplements and she just doesn't do gluten and when she does she knows she's going to pay for it for two or three days that's amazing but she says you know I still really do like Christmas cookies and I'll probably have one or two, <laughs> yes. you know? So again, even though it's something that she knows how to affect her. And I think that's also a valuable piece. Like, do you know how the food that you're consuming affects you personally? And if you do, then you know when to have a little or not have it at all. Right. So she, like I said, she works in the nursery on Sunday. She is very avid that she does not have anything gluten Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. Because she wants to be 100% comfortable, healthy, feeling great for those babies on Sunday. That is a perfect way to know how, how to work within your system and how to work around your system. So you're not entirely giving up something. You just know what to expect. Mm-hmm. And honestly, most weeks she won't consume any gluten. Um, she just doesn't feel the need for it. Um, it's funny because she's... Bread smells gross to me now. Yeah. I, you know, I did the same thing uh, a couple years ago. My husband had given up um, soda for Lent. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, if he gave it up, I gave it up. Sure. It was just a thing. And so by the time Lent was over with, and I went, because at that time, several years ago, I was really into um, Barks root beer. Root beer. Mm -hmm. And so after that period of time, and it was a short period of time for me. I mean, we're talking 40 days. So by the time it was over with and I went back to the sodas, they didn't taste the same. Mm-hmm. So I just kind of stayed away from it. I was like, if I can handle it 40 days, I can go longer. Yeah. So I just didn't have them as often. And gradually, I just, you know, as time went on, I didn't like the taste of it anymore. And definitely, 
a year or so later, I tried to drink something. I think we went somewhere, and that's kind of one of the things they had or all they had at that point. And I was thirsty, so I drank it. But it really, I could actually finally taste the sugar, mm -hmm. the carbonated water. It just all of it, it didn't taste at all good to me. So I yeah. just threw it out. Yeah, and it's amazing how environmentally, when we completely exclude something, and I'm not saying that exclusionary diets are great for life, but they are good for knowing what works for you. But when you exclude something from your nutrition plan and you have it a little bit and you see the effects or you see the taste change or you right. see how things are different, I think that people, if they were willing to gamble on that 30 to 40 days, mm -hmm. they wouldn't feel like so much like they're giving up, but more like, I don't want that. Anymore, right. Mm -hmm. You now have a choice. And that's the whole thing is I came at it in, in the beginning, like I said, I came up to this approach in a very vain way. Mm -hmm. But then once I started to go through the process and I was trying to be as open-minded, but yet disciplined to stick to things as the days went by and the diet slowly started to change, I liked it. Yeah, and I didn't feel like I was losing anything anymore. In fact, I was, the only good thing I was losing was weight. Yes. Yes. Well, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, just making sure that the flavor is there. I don't feel like anybody right. ever feels like they're missing something. And between fresh spices, um, dried spices, um, depending on your taste, if you like spicier, spicier food, True. um, but even if you don't, I mean, the citrus spices are great. If you are a more sweet or savory, um, mm -hmm. a lot of those Middle Eastern, um, Indian type foods, even actually a lot of um, African style foods. Um, my neighbors are Nigerian and they make this spicy coconut rice. Um, oh, that sounds delicious. Oh my gosh, it is so good. And so it's like something that has a very sweet undertone. Right. But there's no sugar in it. And you know, it's sweetened with tomatoes perfect. and coconut milk, you know, so knowing that you can incorporate those different flavors. And I think the more willing you are to branch out in the spice world, mm -hmm. the better your palate and the foods that you're putting on your table are going to be. See, and it's, it's interesting that you bring up that um, the Nigerian factor was something that I came across as well in terms of Alzheimer's, one of the books that I came across was How Not to Die. And I was amazed, amazed, because when there's a section in there that the doctor actually speaks to the fact that in Nigeria, they have, if you're going to consider DNA as your only factor as to whether or not you're going to be predisposed or you're going to have some form of dementia, the Nigerian culture had the highest count of Alzheimer's, the DNA predisposition. Right. And, but on top of that, they also were the lowest count in the world of actual cases with Alzheimer's That's because amazing. of their diet. Mm -hmm. I can see that. And so the willingness, the willingness to step away from the American culture mm -hmm. and it just, it always gets me fired up every time I watch TV and a commercial comes across or we go to the movies and the previews are pushing these, um, the marketing of this cool cylinder, you know, chrome looking can that's diet soda this or that. And it, you're, it's going to improve your life. It's going to give you energy or the energy drinks that are finding their ways into the schools or accessible for kids to have. And it's just, what are we doing to ourselves? We're doing this to ourselves. There, mm -hmm. there is very little anymore of DNA support for these kind of diseases. Yeah. We are doing this to ourselves. So it's just by being open mm -hmm. and trying new things. And I'm glad you said this earlier about cooking, that it's fun because if you make it fun, then you're more likely to stick to it. Absolutely. It's not, it's not the grudgingly day-to-day, yeah. -day, I have to do this. And unfortunately, that's where some people end up. They're in the ER. They're having a heart attack. They're having other... Um, like definitely for me, that opened me wide. My mind was as wide as could be because I had to have my gallbladder removed. Mm -hmm. And once I did that, I absolutely had to watch what I was eating yep. or I would be miserable just yep. like your mother was with the gluten. Yep. And I see that, um, in my family and we have quite a few people that are overweight and even after multiple heart attacks, 
they still don't change their nutrition. Yeah. Even being, um, having chronic disease and chronic arthritis and like all of these horrible pieces, then they still post like, you know, on Instagram, like eating fried catfish, right. eating, you Amazes know, whatever. Me. And I'm like, I don't think that my lifestyle and I, I've even written things about, um, how to be cost effectively healthy mm-hmm. nutritionally. Cause I hear a lot like, Oh, it's too expensive to right. eat clean. Right. Yeah. It's um, a luxury to eat plant-based food and, and it's really not. No, it's not. I can sir I can feed my entire family for under $50 in the plant department. It'll mm-hmm. cost me a hundred dollars to feed them in the processed food department. Exactly. So it's, it's choice. But I see that and it's either they don't care enough or they're still so stuck in that commercialized, but cereal is better. supposed to be healthy for you. No. I'm supposed to have, you know, my tricks and whole milk in the morning and I'm supposed to have... With the orange juice on the side? Right. And, and my, all loaded with sugar everywhere yes, you go? Yes, yes. And maybe a piece of toast and peanut butter, you know? And so it's <laughs> like all it the carbs and they, all that. They get away with it. It's part of a healthy diet. Right, exactly. Or, you know, the, I mean, and I grew up this way too, and, but the, the peanut butter and jelly sandwich and the, oh, right. And the goldfish crackers yep. and the um, chocolate milk and dried fruit for heaven's sakes. People, dried fruit is candy. Yes. Dried fruit is not fruit. Dried fruit is candy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's painful. It's pain. But, I know, you know, and once you learn it, and then, so for me, when I'm out in public and I'm at some event, whether it's for my children or um, just in general, and I see other parents and what they're giving their children, it drives me nuts mm-hmm. because I can't walk over to every person. It is an, a personal choice. Mm-hmm. And when you know better, you do better. Right, exactly. And so when I see these other parents, especially when I see young parents putting soda or sweet tea, as we like it here in the South, in a sippy cup. No. Oh my gosh, that's so painful to me. It infuriates me. But at the same time, I'm like, well, that's kind of how so many people grew up. And they don't know any different. Yeah, I see it. So we have season tickets to Six Flags. And when you get your season ticket, you get this giant yes. cup. So you can drink your soda all day long. free liquid. Mm-hmm. So... My children do not realize that you can get anything other than water or lemonade in theirs. And even the lemonade I cut and I cut in half with water. But it's amazing how many six year olds I see walking around with some dark soda right in there. I'll go out to dinner with my um, in laws and it's crazy that my niece gets two sodas a week and and chocolate milk and she has a severe weight problem. Um, imagine that I always think like water or milk and I know like there's definitely like controversy over the milk thing but let's be real here if you want it if you want flavored something water or milk like that's it's just not that hard and at least then they're getting protein and most places are two percent but even my children will 90 percent of the time choose water because you get ice cubes in it well and once you get used to that (laughs) That's that's one of the things that I had to do for my mother because I couldn't get her to drink water. That mm-hmm. was the daily struggle, still is to this day. The way I was able to get her to drink water was I got um, some ice trays mm-hmm. and I sliced up strawberries very beautiful, very thinly, and I would put that in the ice trays, fill up with water, and would give her that in her water. So she was it would sweeten it just enough. And then when she got to the point where she kind of caught on to it, again, just like the child, sure. and even me personally, I get it. You get burned out after a while. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to do the same thing, slice up the strawberries yep. very finely. And then I would get some sort of like ocean spray juice, which was the lowest amount of sugar that I could find. Mm-hmm. And then even so, water that down and then make the ice cubes out of that. And then we were back on. And after a while, it was just a matter of just changing the flavor of the juice and I rode that out as long as I could until it was time to find something else to substitute to keep continually getting the water in. Yep. And that's the part where, you know, we don't take notice of this until we are having problems, until we're having issues. But instead of waiting until it's the end and having or getting closer to the end and we're having reactive moments, mm-hmm. you know, the ER or doctors, mm-hmm. you know, something's wrong. Um 
we need to change the focus and start with our kids, ourselves first of all, but our kids and start taking more of that proactive approach. Yes. Because with my mother, one of her main symptoms, if we went back in time and tried to go as far back as we could, and even as far back as I could remember, one of her main symptoms was depression. Mm. When I looked at her diet and how it's been, well, it's no wonder. Mm -hmm. It it wasn't always, you know, we were automatically thinking, oh, it's a chemical based. She, her system was just out of balance. She's manic depressive bipolar. And so it's a chemical induced. But when you look at the food that she had, And when she had it, if she had a morning or a day that she had coffee, and that was her, well, the bulk of her nutrient for the day, and I don't even want to call that a true nutrient, then it's no wonder you have the ebb and flows, and then you see the rising numbers of teenage suicide. Yep. I was looking up while you were talking. So ways to flavor your water can actually like benefit you as well. Um, not only flavor wise, mm-hmm. you could actually get a lot out of it to help your mom, not only to detox gut or even for your own gut health, but then right. even for like your teenage son, like helping him to focus better when it's coming up on exam time exactly. or things like that. So here's some examples. Like if you were looking for clearer skin, mm-hmm. um, you could take your water and do cucumber, lemon, and mint mince that together I like that put it in the refrigerator overnight and then you can siphon it off you know throughout the day if you wanted to enhance your metabolism so you want a little bit of better fat burner um apples and cinnamon sticks in your water Hmm. boost your metabolism um let's say that you were like gassy and bloaty and you had like kind of like that irritable system cucumber lemon mint and ginger cool that through your water. Yes. Super refreshing. And if you're looking strictly at weight loss, like strictly fat loss, you could do cucumber, grapefruit, and water. Oh, wow. And so those are going to be like really flavorful, nutrient dense, because you're going to get some of the nutrients out of the foods that you're putting into it. But then like for your son, like clear skin, what teenager doesn't want clear skin? Oh, exactly. And flavored water. And see, and that's where, again, people make the mistake because they fall into the marketing is yep. that flavored water, if you're drinking a carbonated flavored water, then you're back into that cycle of sodas and things that you're not really getting water. I mean, it carbonated. So it's, you know, we're splitting hairs and we're falling into that marketing and so we're, and you're again, getting away from what we could be doing, what we should be doing. Mm-hmm. Definitely options out there, not only to like help with gut health, but then to then help, you know, our, our stubborn Our stubborns. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it took me, it it took some, unfortunately, and and that's how we are wired. It it does take something that's pressing enough for us to finally take notice and make the changes. It absolutely did for me. But if we don't make these changes, then the numbers that are rising right now on dementia related will just Mm -hmm. continue to rise. And it's not just dementia Mm -hmm. because we also have the heart related issues the diabetes yeah you know and a lot of that leads to dementia yep and so it's some people say oh it's dementia and alzheimer's well alzheimer's is dementia it's just the most well-known form and what we do now through our nutrition Mm -hmm. protects our heart protects the rest of our systems Mm -hmm. you know the the heart the brain, the gut. Yep, for sure. And as a caretaker, you're taking care of you and you're taking care of them. Right. And so then how do you make sure that everybody's getting the right nutrition, especially when you also are at the age that you also have children to take care of, you exactly. have a husband, you have a home. Exactly. You know, there's so many things. I it's mean, exhausting. luckily that you're working from home, but... What if you still had to go to the office every day? Like, how do you feed your body the most efficiently, the healthiest when mm-hmm. you, when let's just be real, you don't have a whole lot of time. No. And that's how it was before I did step away from the corporate world. I was trying to squeeze everything in and mm-hmm. I, I eventually started to meal prep, mm-hmm. making yep, salads for that. the week on Sundays. I would make five salads for the week and, you know, Tupperware container, the Yep. refrigerator was full of just all kinds of containers. The I had one side of 
the salads I liked, and I had other salads that we made my that my husband specifically liked. He mm -hmm. loves feta cheese. I can't stand it sometimes. But we made our salads, and then I had separate in containers with chopped up, diced up fruit. Mm -hmm. And so I had that with me. And then I would make the Ziploc bags, and I would get a bunch of mixed nuts. Mm -hmm. Sometimes lightly salted, sometimes not. Mm -hmm. And I would get this, what they call here is a imperial mix and it would have the brazil nuts the cashews yeah. the almonds the uh, pecans and i would just mix a lot of that up and i would take that as my daily snack bag for mm -hmm. that afternoon lull and so it was the little things that made the difference yes yeah for me overall so how did you plan your week did you, you know, make your grocery list on saturday or Friday, Saturday, and then shop for it, and then meal prep on Sunday. That's what did how, that look like? That's how I used to do it, because mm -hmm. it's the working mom, I guess, during the week. It was the last thing in my mind. So come Saturday, we were spending the day doing the house chores, sure. and then the groceries, and then by Saturday night, you're exhausted, your weekend's gone. But then eventually during the week, I had a running list that I would just continually, as soon as something ran out, I wrote it down and just jotted down. Or if I came across something that I wanted to try differently or had to remember to jot it down because mm -hmm. by the time I got to the store there's too many things oh, to get sure. distracted with for and sure. come home with way more than I needed and not what I needed so the list became more of that definite dependent yeah driver of what I'm gonna buy and what I'm gonna stick to so how did you um, kind of change things up I know that a lot of people like again grilled chicken broccoli and mashed potatoes though healthy ish Right. Um, it's boring. It, it I mean, gets boring. Chicken yes. salad every night. Again, boring. How did you continue to change things up, especially having a family? How do you continue to bring and introduce new foods or even meals into your into your kitchen? So one of the things I did was the seasonings. I started yes. with the seasonings because where for budget consciously, uh, if we bought uh, chicken that had uh, or a, package of chicken that had eight pieces, I would go through and I would section it off, you know, four and four. Eventually, as my older son moved on, moved out, um, then it was three, three and uh, two or something. Mm -hmm. And just breaking it out to where if we're going to have chicken so often, I don't want the same old, same old chicken For sure. all the time. So, and especially since we weren't frying anything anymore, I was going to get to the point where I needed to learn seasonings. And so if one day was a uh, Lemon pepper, for example. The next day was something else, like you said, the savory, dif mm -hmm. just different. And then I even started buying packets of salad dressing. There's oh, a yeah. Fiesta, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a Fiesta Ranch, because mm -hmm. we like a little bit of the spicy. Yeah. And um, I learned how to cook that with it and just seasonings coming down mm -hmm. to all the different flavors. And then after a while, I was like, okay, I don't care what seasoning I have. I just cannot eat chicken anymore. Yes, yes. And so then it had to be, what else is out there? Well, then we turned to turkey and we were doing, you know, turkey loaves and yep. um, adding the, the vegetables, you know, I would grate carrots and add it mm -hmm. into, and like diced onions, add that into the meatloaf. And yep. so after a while, it's like you really get stretched to your limits. Mm -hmm. And so I, you have to get creative mm -hmm. and trying to find what's creative yet convenient Right. is the happy balance. Mm -hmm. And it really came down to that grocery list. Yep. So I knew what I could freeze, mm -hmm. what I could, Smart. what had to go sooner in the week than later. Because if I did, there's times that I, I like fresh produce versus the frozen vegetables. Sure. Trying to find the, reduce down the amount of staples that we use, the rice, the pastas. Yeah. You know, transition over to some long grain brown rice or yep. orzos or um, mm -hmm. quinoa, couscous. I mean, just mm -hmm. changing it up any way I could. So even if we did have that seasoned chicken, okay, maybe if I change the sides yep. to dress it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We do something similar. So I like to, so I'm an avid fan of like looking through cookbooks and recipes and I'm also a huge doctor of recipes. So I will take a <laughs> recipe that looks amazing that mm. is probably not as clean as I would want it to be. Right. And I make adjustments. Tweak it. Oh, for sure. For sure. And especially anything that's like, and optional, you could add two tablespoons of brown sugar. Just, you know, I'm never doing that. Yes. But if you needed, so I made, actually, I made um, 
a curry dish uh, a few weeks ago and it was amazing. So it was like mm. chicken and it had like a blend of curry seasoning and then you added coconut milk and then you added one and a half cups of carrots to sweeten it and some, I think there was mushrooms and spinach, whatever. It was incredibly good from first chop until fully cooked it was 22 minutes. I, I, video, I videoed it, so I timed it. I know I'm kind of a geek like that, but... Um, <laughs> hey, but practice makes perfect. That's right. Well, but in, <laughs> And then it, it had so much flavor onto it. But that brown sugar, I could see later, I was like, okay, that would have added just that undertone. Of, like, it seemed like it was sort of missing something, a sort of undertone of sweet. But as I was prepping it, like, the flavor and the smell that came off of that combined between the seasoning and the coconut... I was like, ooh, you know what would be really good with this is pineapple. Mm. And so I actually ended up cutting fresh pineapple and putting it as one of our sides. But next time, I would actually probably cook um, small pineapple it. into it to give it that extra sugar, to give it that extra sweetness, Absolutely. to give it that extra flavor. And I don't remember what I put on the side of it. Um, it was one of our favorite dishes, and I think it's, um, of my recipes, it's one of the ones that's uh, most repeated. Like, I have so many friends that have been like, oh my gosh, I made your dish last night and it was incredible because the depth of flavor was so great. I have two small boys, so it wasn't overly spicy in the, in the hot sense, mm -hmm. but it had so much flavor. And the spinach, because it got cooked down, like they just ate it. They didn't, they didn't realize really it was notice there. it. Love I mean, it. yeah, I mean, it was like little green, you know, strings of whatever, but they just, yeah, ate Flatten it. Flattened green beans. Yeah, for all they yeah, need to whatever. Know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. They like mushrooms, so that wasn't an issue either. But yeah, it was just very depth of flavor. And so I love to look at recipes and see, you know, what different spices are there. And economically, dried seasonings can give you so much flavor for very little money. And so yes. adding all of that depth of flavor for, you know, when you break it down, maybe an extra 10 cents. Right, right. So worth it. So worth it. And especially, so we're kind of on a, a little bit of a curry kick um, just because my mom loves those flavors and I'm loving spice right now. But uh, adding adding those little depths of those flavors and then adding red chili flakes to it. like Yes, um, I And agree. you can flavor everybody's plate differently. So for my children, I don't put any red fla uh, oh, right, pepper flakes right. on them because I want them to... You want them to eat it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and to taste the depth of flavor in all of the spices where sometimes that hot seasoning will take some of that depth of flavor away. But then for, you know, us adults, like we'll each take a... Take a shake at that right. red pepper <laughs> Spice it up. Yeah. And um, so that's one of the things that we do. But I also look at things for my recipes for two to three things. How many ingredients are there? Because if it's if I have to cut down, you know, 19 items, it's yes. just not happening. I mean, it's yes. really intensive. If it's going to take more than an hour and a half to cook, it's not lifestyle intelligent no, for exactly. me. exactly. And you can't do it on the run. Exactly. Just, there's Then that's where... The diets and the lifestyle breaks down. Yep, yep. And then um, lastly is um, how long does it stay in the fridge? Yes. So fish for me personally is not amazing reheated. Um, oh, right. So, well, honestly, I don't really care that much. My family will not eat reheated heated fish. So if I'm going to do a fish diet, I'm really conservative about the portions that mm -hmm. I serve. And I'll usually maybe even add a chicken or something on the side for anybody that wanted protein for, you know, the next day or the next day after that. So just being mindful about how long something will last in the refrigerator. Um, some things, like I made an, an Israeli salad the other day, which is essentially just a cucumber, tomato, onion, lemon dressing salad. Unbelievably amazing flavor-wise. Yeah, but it gets, it gets better every day. I love those. Yeah. So it lasts about four it days before. Yeah, lasts about four days before your tomatoes become questionable. But yeah, like day three, that is the jam. Like it's nice and cold. Take some shredded chicken breast that's also cold. Throw it on top. Amazing. If you want to get really spicy with it, you could add some feta cheese. You know, <laughs> you could um, dice up some uh, Kalamata tomatoes <laughs> or um, sorry, Kalamata olives. So yeah, you can get really, but um, that's something that we do. Is See, try. and then in addition to that and how long it lasts in the refrigerator, that's where something that if portion control, so if I knew I was prepping and if it was going to take me a little bit longer than normal, I would add extra portions deliberately so that mm -hmm. I can get two meals out of it. Yep. So we would have dinner For and sure. then lunch I could take the next day. But of yep. course, like you said, 
I'm not one to reheat fish the next day, and I certainly know that's the cardinal rule in an office somewhere. Right. The person that brings the fish to microwave, um, no. You must hate everyone in there if you do that. <laughs> yeah, I've, that's definitely been me, and I've definitely been talked to about it. <laughs> <laughs> that and burnt popcorn. Right? So funky. <laughs> so funky. This has been fabulous, and you, this is exactly why you came to mind when Thank I you. was going through this, because um, when... I look at it in terms of a caregiver, how to help the caregiver remain healthy and expand their knowledge, their base, their energy sources. Yes. This is the big thing. I mean, we have other topics to go into on for other days, but this is one of the, I, I believe personally it starts here. For sure. Because for sure. it is that Pareto principle, you know, 80% of what we do has or 20, I'm sorry, 20% of what we do has 80% of the results out yeah. of our life or some kind of variation on variation that. Yes. of that. And so when we start with how we fuel ourselves, mm-hmm. um, we can go just about anywhere from there. And the sad part of it is with caregivers, and this includes parents because parents are yeah. caregivers. Mm-hmm, I know sure. we call them parents because they're the little ones that you're biologically tied to, but you're still a caregiver. You're still caring for someone else yes. other than yourself. And for us as caregivers of older parents or care recipients, when our care recipients pass on, the caregiver tends to get sick mm-hmm. or even more ill in some cases because they've put everything into yep. their care recipient and they have pretty much lost sight of their own care, yeah, their own self care, and so much of this does start with the lifestyle and yep. nutrition. Yep. So I agree. Thank you so yeah, much for so helping Thanks explain. For inviting me. It gets to be. I mean, we could talk for hours because there's so much more to do. I love to talk about food. Anytime you want me to talk about food, I and now I'm hungry. Now that all of this. I don't <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Definitely. So, thanks everybody for tuning in today. Um, I definitely. This is going to take us right into the next one um, where we talk about lifestyle and how this fueling up for nutrition goes into um, once you get this fuel and what you do with it. In our next podcast, we're going to go over uh, lifestyle in terms of exercise and fitness. And uh, if you would like to hear more or if you missed any of the other ones, you definitely can reach out on um, online and find it under jessicalazellcannon.com. And you absolutely can find Katie Epps at mybodygx.com. Yep, absolutely. And if you want to follow me on Instagram because you like the idea of the recipes that I've been talking about, um, I post them on the regular, um, usually two to two to four recipes a week. So at mybodygx, um, I would love to have you uh, check out the recipes. And I also do do fitness and workouts on there as well. So if that's something that you're interested in as well, there's um, everything from, you know, body weight to gym exercises. So I'm looking at all health and wellness, the entire kit and caboodle. Highly recommend her. All right. Thank you. (laughs) Until next time. learn more about proactive caregiving and to hear other episodes of this podcast, please go to www.jessicalizellcannon.com. That's www.jessicalizellcannon.com. This podcast is produced by Canon Light Media LLC, www.canonlightmedia.com. Music provided by Chris Paradise. Asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. 
Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.